This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> The journey is the goal after all, and we are all on our separate journeys together. The only person in control of your timeline and outcome is you, and the only factor that determines the acceleration of your journey is how ready you are to get radically honest with yourself. Please remember, this type of energetic evolution doesn't have anything to do with anyone but you. It is only you. Valerie Atelis interviews Kevin Russell, the author of Radical Enlightenment, my Guy on the Ninth Floor, a handbook for leveling up your consciousness, fulfillment, and connection to your higher self. Kevin Russell is a consciousness accelerator who uses energy transformation and subconscious change techniques to rewrite programs and conditioning that keep us stuck in life, providing relief from stress and trauma. As a clairvoyant and intuitive, he also channels hyper-personal directed knowing, messages, and insight to help others expand awareness release resistance, and reconnect to their innate wholeness. He authored a groundbreaking book, Radical Enlightenment, My Guy on the Ninth Floor, which was written after a profound enlightenment experience that connected him to his higher energetic self. It has become a handbook for leveling up consciousness, fulfillment, and connection to your higher self so you can reach your own state of radical enlightenment. For the last 20 years, as a user interface, user experience designer and experience strategist, he specialized in designing creative solutions that guided a user on a journey through an experience to an intended outcome. By coupling the skills he had honed in the design field with what he had learned on his own journey of self-discovery, he realized that he had the keys to guide others at lightning fast speed. His practice guides people through a step-by-step -step process to experience the self-awareness, self-expansion, and healing that is so deeply needed today for each of us as individuals and collectively as stewards of our planet. Meet Kevin at RadicalEnlightenment.com. Here is the interview with Kevin Russell. In your own words, who is Kevin Russell? Ooh, such a good question. Um, I am an observer of my life as I'm experiencing it. I am an energetic being having a human experience. And then there's a bunch of labels that we can, that we can place on top of that. But those are things I do, not necessarily who I am. How did you get to these, um, understandings? So perhaps even going beyond understanding, how did you realize these things? A big part of it was, uh, uh, it's been a lifelong journey, lifelong curiosity. Um, yes. And has always been an answer that I've or always been a question, I should say, um, that I've been carrying with me, uh, around many things in our world. And then I, my own personal journey hit an accelerator pad about, uh, five or six years ago and really, uh, getting into the subconscious work getting into the subconscious programs and mechanisms that exist within our systems and also learning uh, methods of inquiry of, of how to get answers from our subconscious and really have a more functional relationship with it uh, were, were the vehicles that got me to, to where I am now. Yeah, it's the subconscious. Is that something that we sometimes refer as the soul, the heart, the spirit, or it's something different? I would say soul, heart, and spirit would be more in alignment with our super conscious or our higher self, our inner knowing, our the, that, that spark, that inner, I, I call it our, our quantum love engine uh, at our heart center. Subconscious is my collective term for everything outside of 
that heart space and the conscious mind. So the autonomic nervous system, all of our biology, all of our physiology, uh, fight, flight, freeze responses, all of our senses are part of the subconscious bio machine that, that we inhabit and we inhi- that we uh, uh, are, are living life through. So there are many parts of the human experience, oh, the human, uh, what do you call this? We call human beings. Um, human human form human ex- yeah experience i like experience um you know we, we are physical we are mental we are emotional we are spiritual and at the supporting all of that is we are energetic when it comes to that i do have a question for you it was here for later on i have heard also or we have heard i'm sure you have that energy cannot be created nor destroyed that has something to do with the laws of thermodynamics. So when I hear that, it's interesting. I think of energy not being created because we have no idea how this came to be, right? No one can explain this. So in a way, if it has never been created, then this is a dream. We are imagining everything. There, there is uh, definitely a certain level of um, uh, simulation or, or, or matrix, uh, labels or, or views that we can take of our experience in the world. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one of those where to me, it, 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 boiling everything down to everything is energy is simple, but it's not easy. Mm. I think we've heard, we've heard that a lot, you know, Oh, everything's energy. Okay. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's almost, it's almost an accepted statement in in many camps these days, but then applying it, applying that (laughs) to our daily lives. Mm. That's where, um, the practice came in for me. And then just really moving through additional layers of awareness and expansion, uh, along those lines. So I became aware of my own thoughts, um, what was going on on the inside and gaining a little bit of perspective, observational distance internally, uh, when I was in a traditional talk therapy when I was younger. And that was my first really expanse into a place of who is having these thoughts who is who is i who is behind my name what 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 am i doing what am i about what, you know what what is and then that uh, ex, you know that awareness has expanded on my journey of uh, of energy transformation and release and and awareness to the point where now it's uh, and awareness of ancestral energy that has found its way to me that I've I've released and transformed um, past life energy um, in the same regard. So yeah, the the it, it's the it's the tip of the iceberg of everything mm-hmm. is energy, and then it gets <laughs> uh, it can get more entangled and complex from there. But it really sounds really simple though. If everything's energy, when I hear that. Then you just mentioned the idea of applying that statement to this idea into our lives. How can we apply something that already is? So it's, it's uh, more of the application of the awareness of it. And then what do we do with it? And so for me, that took the form of uh, you know, mental training and brain games, in a way, of really holding myself accountable for the thoughts that passed through my field, um, the reactions that I would experience on the inside, and then also, uh, you know, emotions. Um, you know, what, what, why, why, why did I have this emotional reaction to this experience? Uh, why did I react so so vehemently or so um, negatively to something somebody else said? And so, really holding up that mirror and becoming aware of the language we use for ourselves, the language we use with others, because this is where we get to the, it's simple, but it's not easy. Language is energy. The language we use for ourselves and others carries energetic weight. So if we are saying things like, oh, I'll never find a partner, or I don't want the relationship my parents had, we're actually creating those things within our subconscious, within our systems. So for me, that was the, that was one of the the starting points of, uh, regulating and being aware of the language I was using for myself and others. Uh, and then also 
in interpersonal communication as opposed to waiting for another to finish speaking or thinking about what I'll say or thinking what the other person is thinking about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's getting to this place of just uh, presence and being in the moment, which mm-hmm. is, is a practice in and of itself. Yeah, it's a paradox, isn't it? Because it sounds like being, just being, requires no practice. Whole practice is being. And that's one of the main questions I ask my, myself and or whatever is here and my guests is, who is applying these things? Who, who is practicing? Who is choosing thoughts? It comes to me that there's nobody doing that, really. It's this dance of energy, of unbounded, unlimited energy, expansive energy, just doing what it does. And there's no one really controlling anything or choosing anything. This idea has become a lot more um, clear in a way, if I can use a word to say that to me these days. I'm doing this, like meeting you today, talking to you. And the question is always, who is talking? What is it? <laughs> I have no idea what's happening here. This is amazing. <laughs> it's the unknown unfolding. And uh, it's interesting to kind of catch that after it already happened, in a way. Almost like recording <laughs> what's the experience. But I'm not the owner. I'm not the catalyst of anything. Or well, the idea of I, of me. Yeah, yeah. The, the getting to the isness of the experience, even behind the I, even behind the I am, getting getting to the nowness. Yeah, I think for me, it's more openness and curiosity uh, about myself. I wonder. I wonder what. I wonder what is behind that. I wonder what that is there. And then really being open to those answers coming from within, being able to pull those answers from the subconscious. And then the other side of it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say the other side of it is discerning between, you know, quote unquote, my thoughts or thoughts uh, from the isness or thoughts from the system. And there's been research done around positive and negative thoughts. And about 95 to 98% of the thoughts that our system has, our system, not us, on any given day are going to be negative because our systems are risk averse and they're main priority, their their main directive is safety, planning, and protection at all cost. And so differentiating between those was a big step for me as well, recognizing that I am not my thoughts, my feelings, or my, I'm sorry, not my thoughts, my emotions, or my reactions. And then opening that up, okay, well, if those aren't me, then who am I? What is, what is I? What is the isness? And for me, that's the, that's the energy behind that's the energy that animates these forms. That's the, the connectivity, the universal love that we all share. Um, the, the connection layer is the isness. And then I get, uh, the, the signature of that energy is what I think we can apply labels of I am to. That's the energy within the system behind the thoughts. So why not to say that we are everything, that we are both, right? Conditions and also the unconditioned. I love that idea. Everything is ideas to me. (laughs) Like it's playful that way. (laughs) Concepts, ideas, and I'm just open to whatever. But for some reason, some things, some concepts, they resonate more than others. So talk to me for a moment about your understanding of enlightenment. The title of your book is Radical Enlightenment, My Guy on the Ninth Floor. I love that for some reason. (laughs) My Guy on the Ninth Floor. That's playful too. So yeah, Kevin, talk to me about that, the idea of enlightenment. Yeah, so for me, enlightenment is it's a practice. It's, it's not necessarily a goal or a destination, although I think uh, collectively we've approached it as such. But there's a, a, a term in Zen Buddhism uh, called Satori, a Satori experience. And that's really where I resonate with, where my interpretation of, of that word is uh, the micro enlightenments along the way, the aha moments, those light bulb moments, those understandings or intuitive hits or awarenesses that we get on the path that we get on the journey. So it's so, it's a practice, uh, and uh, you know the it, it's a it's a daily practice of awareness, of observation, of discernment, of uh, reconciliation, 
of things going on within us, of release, releasing attachment, releasing resistance, releasing fear. All of those things go to really create, for me, what the label of enlightenment is talking about. Uh, releasing fear, that's a big one. Is that possible to release all fears and become fearless? I don't know about all fears. Uh, the only two natural fears that humans have are the fear of falling and fear of loud noises. And those are, those are biological imperatives. Those are, we're, we're born with those. However, every other fear is either learned, conditioned, programmed, or taught. So, you know, in that regard, and again, this is where discernment comes in. So if we remove fear from the equation, then we need to be more discerning with what it is we do want, what it is we're going after, as opposed to what it is we're trying to get away from or trying to avoid, because those are two very different approaches to life, going towards something positive or trying to get away from something negative. So I'd say, you know, biologically, I think we will still have a reaction to loud noises or the sensation of falling. But for me, every other, every other fear or limitation or phobia is on the table for release and transformation. Absolutely. What about balance? Mm. Is that, <laughs> yeah, is that another destination, the, a misconception we have, a place to arrive and stay at? Absolutely. Yeah. So balance is something that, uh, you know, balance to me, well, there's multifacets to balance. Um, there, there can be negative balance. And a lot of times I'll look at this in relationships. Um, if we've got something that is imbalanced, where there is verbal, mental, or emotional abuse going on, and then there is an overgiving or uh, you know a codependency on the other side, you know, for in a narcissistic codependent overgiving uh, type of balance, that is a balance. It's it's not a desired balance. It's not a positive balance, and it is asymmetrical because it's not equal. But the the entire universe to me is is really based in balance but it's not it's not a zen om meditation balance it's more as i as i as i communicate in the book is more of a radical balance and getting to a place of flow would be what i would term the balance that is most traditionally thought of getting to that flow state that would be a positive balance for me the the true swing and a golf swing where you don't even feel, feel the ball or when you're in a flow state of creativity, of music, of painting, of, of words or writing. To me, those are the, that's the desired balance. Finding that is a practice. Um, I don't think it's anything we achieve. I think it's something we arrive at and we'll get knocked off because of life. We, we get knocked off of balance because of an expectation we might have or a comparison or judgment that we might carry. And those are just additional practices of release and transformation. Because if we are in judgment or reaction or comparison, we are keeping ourselves diminished and keeping ourselves enmeshed with the things that really shackle us in the outer world, in our three-dimensional world. So it's um, very interesting, the idea of uh, the flow that you're connected to practice of doing something, whatever it is, but it seems like without the attachment to it or practicing without, wow, practicing without practicing. There you go. <laughs> so that's something that the subconscious does, right, Kevin? It's automated responses or reactions like uh, waking up, brushing my teeth and doing everything that I do. I don't think about it. It seems to be automated. Is that also connected to flow somehow? Do you connect those simple practices, daily practices to flow? So it depends. I think uh, so a lot of our waking life is automated to your point. Um, about 95 to 90%, 99% of our waking life is either influenced or controlled by the subconscious, by our autonomic systems, by our beliefs, by the things that we embed at our at the subconscious level, the rules that we keep um, the ways of being, who to love, how to love, what to say, how to act, how to behave. None of these things are originated from within us. All of these things are learned or conditioned behaviors that have come from outside of us. 
So for me, finding the flow state has been decoupling myself with these things that I'm experiencing within my body as beliefs, as thoughts, as reactions, as behaviors, decoupling myself from those things and really holding up that mirror of whose voice is behind these need tos, these have have tos, these shoulds, behind these beliefs, behind these behaviors. And decoupling myself from those while at the same time, you know, practicing, not, not practicing the practice of awareness <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. <laughs> of, of, you know, am I using these words? I can't do it. Oh, I should really, I should really do these things. I, I should read, Oh, I'll, I'll try, I'll try and make it. All of these words are distancing language from ourselves and from others. And it really just reinforces the programs at the subconscious level. And it effectively works to keep us stagnant. So finding that flow state has been a practice of deconstructing a lot of the, the external things that I've embedded within myself as, as you know, what I had in the past perceived as a need of survival or a need of thriving or a need of being accepted. And changing it from an outside-in management structure of life to an inside out expansion experience in life. And that's where I've been finding the more, the more ability to connect with those flow states more often. Right. So we don't stay there. It, we kind of go in and out of that state. It sounds to me. Exactly. And, and the, for me, the practice is getting there more often or at least recognizing when I get knocked off of that place or knocked out of that place. And then that's when I employ that openness and curiosity. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm feeling off right now. What was it? What, what did I just experience? And then we can even start communicating with our subconscious and getting information from it that can help with that release and expansion. Wow, it sounds like very much doing deep healing work uh, or self-inquiry, um, self-discovery work. Another question I have for you, do you connect the idea of uh, spontaneity, just being spontaneous, to radical enlightenment, to that state as well? As far as an openness to it? I'm not sure what that really means because I hear a lot about this when we come to this space, to the realization that this life is just happening. We are in the midst of the unknown, that this is all there is, like this moment right now, there's nothing else. Then we become more spontaneous, more playful. We kind of gracefully dance per se, I, I love the word dance. We dance uh, with life more often, or oh, why not all the time? So I'm wondering if that is, yeah, if that's part of it, well, what are you trying to communicate? Yeah, it, it is definitely. Um, and I think the more present and, and non-attached we are to either outcomes uh, with, with things that we are desirous of or uh, attached to resistance of because we're hyper-focused on what we don't want, that brings us to an expansive place of, of, the, of the present moment, of the now. And I think that's where spontaneity is, uh, has, has much more chance of taking root and growing in abundance. Um, for me, there's a, a real quick, there's a, a beautiful allegory uh, where there's a farmer and he's got a couple of horses. And there's a storm that blows through the valley and it breaks the fence and the horses get out. And the rest of the villagers from his town come and they'd say, oh, what bad luck, what misfortune, what are you going to do with planting season coming up? Uh, your horses have escaped. And the farmer says, maybe. So he's just in the moment. Next week, his two horses come back leading a pack of, wi uh, leading a herd of wild horses, 12 deep. So now he's got 14 horses. Oh, what good fortune the entire village pours out. Uh, you've been blessed. You will have such abundance moving forward. And the farmer says, maybe. And the next week, the, the, his son, his eldest son is out uh, taming the horses and he's, he's bucked off and he breaks his arm. Oh, what bad luck. What bad fortune. How will you plant your fields? What will you do with your eldest and most able son being out of commission? And the farmer says, eh, maybe. Following week, the king's guard come to subscribe all able-bodied men for uh, military duty. And the son can't go because his arm's broken. 
oh, what good fortune or what bad luck, depending on your perspective. The, your, your son can't fulfill your family's honor and go off and fight war. Or thank goodness your son was spared be- because he has a broken arm. Right. Maybe. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's really living from that, from that place uh, of maybe uh, that, has, that has really brought those opportunities for spontaneity uh, much more closer to my experience. Thank you for explaining that clearly, Kevin. It, with the beautiful story, I have heard that before, and so true. A question that I usually ask another question is, is about if it is really possible to live without belief systems, values, and stories, basically. I think we're just telling stories all the time. We're creating them. So is that really possible to stop that? I don't know. I, I think it is uh, possible to some extent to turn down the volume or the uh, intensity in which we experience those things. But our stories are what make up, our stories are really what we're here to do. We're here to experience life. We're here to experience the contrast and really in all of its forms, uh, political, the way we live our lives, the things we choose to experience, the things we choose to watch, the things we choose to engage with. That's where we have an opportunity to really set down our beliefs and open up our internal expansion to, and I love how you put it, I'm I'm a huge fan of ideas and thoughts as opposed to beliefs. Because ideas and thoughts, we can expand, we can change, we can evolve, but beliefs are very rigid and fixed, so those are more challenging. So the more that I have released and let go of beliefs, the more I have come back to a really core place of universal values of expressing and communicating with others and with myself with radical honesty, accepting everything in the world exactly as it is, having empathy for absolutely everyone, because regardless of how bad or evil we might perceive someone as, they're doing the absolute best they can with the tools in their toolbox, with the tools that they have. And then also looking at it from a place of of balance and that, you know, sometimes the world isn't fair and sometimes the, uh, you know, like baby cheetahs are adorable, but they have to hunt gazelle in order to survive. Um, Sometimes bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, but any of those are comparisons and judgments. And so really holding up that mirror to ourselves and the, the becoming a steward of our internal space, what type of uh, internal cleaning are we doing around our language, around our thoughts, around what we consider beliefs or judgments and comparisons of others. So releasing all of those, to me, is that practice of the isness, the practice of the flow, the balance, and the practice of getting to a place of radical enlightenment. So you wrote the book, Radical Enlightenment, My Guy on the Ninth Floor, a handbook for leveling up your consciousness, fulfillment, and connection to your higher self. Talk to me about the main inspiration and intention of writing your book, Kevin. So the, the, it's funny, the main inspiration was actually an enli- a, a radically enlightening experience that I, I had in the fall of 2019, it was actually November 21st, 2019 in the afternoon. And I'd been doing my work. I'd been doing, you know, becoming aware, uh, you know, self, uh, transformation with different modalities of energy work and really just taking it one step at a time and not looking for anything. I was uh, happy in a design career. I was living what I would consider a fulfilled or fulfilling life, um, in that career. And the yes and was was still there. The yes and was that thing that was following me. And at the time, the way I was communicating, it was I felt like a toddler in a dark room where I, there, energetically there was something more just beyond what I could perceive. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but there's something there. So I have this uh, massive enlightenment experience with an energy working energy work practitioner. Uh, it was a no touch, no talk session. And I literally like, would. I felt experienced and what I was, what I had communicated to me was I connected to my higher self and the voice in my head changed just slightly. I didn't realize this until after I did some research, but not everybody has a voice in the head. Uh, A lot of times if you are reading a book or you're thinking thoughts, you hear your, your own voice. And what I heard in my own voice in my own head was, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you've made it. We're going to have so much fun together. 
I was like, okay, that's wild. That's interesting. Where the title of the book came from, one of the analogies uh, the practitioner gave me was that it was like you were on an elevator in a high rise building going from the third to the fifth floor. But your guy in the ninth floor is like, hey, buddy, up here, this is where the action is. And then uh, I get a little bit more information in the session. And then about two and a half weeks later, the book flooded out of me. Uh, I ended up writing it in two and a half weeks. And it was uh, the, one of the most pure flow states I've ever uh, experienced. Not tired, not hungry, writing maybe 16 hours a day, just pure inspiration, pure flow, pure channeling. So what I came to was uh, a framework or a blueprint that anybody can apply to their own lives of thought exercises, awareness practices, of um, reconciling all of the facets, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional aspects of our experience and our ex of our existence in these human forms of arriving at our own answers for our own selves and creating our own connection with whatever we term my guy on the ninth floor. That just happened to be my label for it. And really uh, empowering and employing people with the tools that they can employ along the way to arrive at their own answers uh, for all of these things that we've been talking about. So it really sounds like it was a choiceless action. It just happened, right? That, that's yeah, why I don't I, believe in choice. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I had the experience on a Thursday afternoon. It was the Thursday before Thanksgiving and I drove straight to my wife's office and I, I, she had a space in her schedule. And I sat down and I told her everything that happened and I said, I can't do design anymore. I, I literally cannot do this anymore. I, you know, and we talk about releasing the have tos, but it was one of those, like, I have to do this. It was a compelling, like, like I have, I have these tools that I can, I can help with, uh, personal transformation. I can help with individual transformation with the book, uh, within my practice as a, as a practitioner, then we can, you know, we can accelerate things in that regard. It wasn't a choice, but it was something that I was ready for, if that makes sense. Something in you, the energies in you, they were ready to move, to go to a different space. That's what it is really, right, Kevin? Energy is just, um, constantly moving, but sometimes moving in a radical way. It has happened to me too, that changed everything, the way I thought and behaved, <laughs> everything changed. I'm like, what's happening? And that's, um, it's life happening, isn't it? Just life happening. It's, it's life happening and, and the universe coinciding with life as it happens. I tend to think that the universe is in us. We are in it and it is in us. There's no separation, really. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. So you are a consciousness accelerator. Talk to me about what it's like to work with you. And if uh, clients, they meet you online, offline, groups, how does it work, Kevin? Yeah. Um, so the majority of my one-on-one uh, -on -one clients, we, will, we usually meet on Zoom. Um, I, I've, I work with clients all over the world. Um, we're located in Southern California. So if it is a preference and it works out, I'm happy to uh, work in, in person with, with clients as well. Group sessions and some uh, remote sessions I do outside of a face-to-face. -face. Uh, and these are more for like an emergency uh, energy tune-up and emergency energetic system balance, uh, which I liken to a 30, 60, 90,000 mile tune-up on our car, uh, where we, we take it into the shop and we look at it from about 40 I think right now we're at 45 different points of inspection from uh, our energetic and our, our biome and our ecology, uh, looking at all the different facets of the way energy intersects with those aspects of our bodies. And uh, my wife is also in the space. And the, the thing I like to say is uh, she works more as a surgeon where she will go in and be very uh, particular. And I go in more as an excavator where I instruct the, the client system Anything and everything we're ready to release or transform around our focus or around the symptoms that we're looking at, that if as long as it's safe and appropriate and in the client's best and highest good, then we will release. And so from that approach, we're able to really, to your point, uh, rapidly transform big bundles of energy, uh, large knots of either trauma or resistance or attachment or, I mean, past life and ancestral energy as well to return ourselves, to return our, our systems back to stasis, back to balance. Because when we're out of balance, it's hard to really do anything. We're in a fight, flight, freeze state. 
Uh, and so, yeah, we can use it for, uh, for uh, trauma relief, for uh, pain relief, for healing. We can also use the practice for accelerating us towards what we do want, uh, abundance, relationships, happiness. Uh, it's, it's really a, a universal tool in that regard. I love healing works, any kind of work, especially energy work. And I do Reiki. Do you also use uh, the method Reiki or hypnotherapy, meditations? Not Reiki per se. Um, the way that I work, uh, the foundation was in, uh, was in two practices. Uh, one is called the emotion code. And then another is called Psyche or psycho psychological kinesiology. And I practiced those on and for myself uh, for about five or six years before evolving into my own practice and, and my own approach to things. Um, so using those as a foundation of emotional release and then also subconscious transformation from the belief standpoint or you know, from what we're experiencing as reality at the subconscious level, um, we can actually influence that. Um, we can consciously in, uh, influence those, uh, those energies that exist within the system and really redirect them towards the positive. Because as I mentioned, so often because our systems are risk adverse, we are hyper focused at the subconscious level on risk mitigation or management. And so extracting ourselves from that dance, taking ourselves out of that entanglement was one of the biggest accelerators for me on my own journey, really getting, getting to that subconscious level. So it's not hypnotherapy, but we are still, we are still addressing the energies at the subconscious level. And that's where, that's where the magic happens for me. Um, because then we, then we optimize the, the car, we optimize the body, uh, and get it more aligned in working for us with, you know, to your point about getting to that balance, getting to that abundance of, of love, of, you know, stability of however it manifests. Those are not destinations, but right. it's really wonderful to have access to them. That it's, it, that's a practice in and of itself. Exactly. It, it's keeping these things resonant within us, keeping the positive energies resonant within us and enabling ourselves to release and transform anything less than light or love. Thank you so much for your work. Kevin, it sounds really wonderful. It's making me thinking, oh, maybe my husband and I, we need some of that, <laughs> both of Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, it's, it, this is the practice. I just hit a, I hit something this, this past week that I was, it was almost like hitting my head against a wall. And I, I turned to my wife and I was like, can you, can you help me out? Can you see what's going on? Cause I just, I can't see it. So, you know, she was able to help pull me back from that wall, take a step to the right and recognize, oh, there's a door right there. I can just walk through so per perspective and helpers, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, uh, and it is, it's, it's not a one and done and it is not a destination. It's a, it's, it's something we take with us. We take the practical tools of, of the mental work and the, the, the brain games. And really those were just vehicles of, of co connecting more to that heart center, getting more into that feeling state, connecting the thinking and the feeling, which gets us more to that whole system integration and really brings us to a place of, of functional operation instead of, you know, feeling like we're white knuckling life or like we're barely keeping our head above water so often as, as many of us do. And I wonder a lot of times why some of us will never get to access those states, have those experiences, freeing experiences. And you mentioned earlier about being ready because we need to be ready for it. What makes us ready to expand? That, that could be anything. For me, a lot of actually that for me, it, it's, it's rock bottom and rock bottom doesn't have to be the romanticized vision of it that, that we often associate with the term for some rock bottom could be getting a B on a quiz or, uh, getting scolded at our job or, um, you know, not getting the, the job that we really, really wanted. That can be an expression of rock bottom, but until we have something to push off of, until we have maybe collected enough contrast in our system that we're holding on to that we get to a point of just being, okay, I can't take this anymore. I'm ready for something to change. Most often because we are living within the systems that are really controlling a majority of our, our lives, we don't recognize that we are in a system that is controlling our lives. And we, sometimes we really like playing the game of life. 
you know, if, if we're if we're oriented towards a defender uh, archetype or label, and we are pat and our family has has uh, been, let's say, in the police force or in armed forces, that is a role that we take up the mantle of a lot of times almost unthinkingly because well, my mom and dad do it, or my uncle does it, or this, you know, all the boys in our family do it, or all, or all the girls in our family do it. It's only when we step back and say, wait, is this me? Or we get to a place of resistance, we're like, I can't, I literally can't do this anymore, that we open ourselves up to change. And so I, I've, I've, I've hit various levels, various degrees and expressions of rock bottom my entire life. And they've been some of the most abundant and expansive springboards uh that i could have ever hoped for and so that's really it when you know when when we get when we get friction or when we get uh you know resistance that builds up some some heat that's the place where we can make choices to you know take stock is what i'm doing working for me does this make me happy and then that's really awareness and recognition and then getting to a place of choice and getting to a place of of confidence or even just Sometimes uh, I say, sometimes we just have to chuck it in the effort bucket and do it anyway. So just getting this place of readiness of, you know what, I'm done and, and kind of damning the consequences. I'm miserable in this job. I'm miserable in this relationship and really discerning, you know, getting through the layers of, you know, is this really not a match for me or is this a conditioned reaction or response to something and having that discernment? But then also having the ability within us to extract ourselves from those situations that no longer serve us or that are keeping us limited. And another question that came to mind, oh, we almost at the end, I could talk to you forever on this, is <laughs> discerning when we are being, uh, let's say, greedy, I think the word mm. is, like, because this is really uh, something that's a trade of the ego. It's mm. never to be satisfied with anything, finding <laughs> issues everywhere, you know. Yeah. And so getting what it wants and then uh, it's not enough. And then it always wants more. It's this, uh, I think they call it the hungry ghost. So how do we know when we are not being the hungry ghost, but having the sincere desire to expand towards unconditional love? I, I love that term hunger ghost. I hadn't heard that before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that one with me. That's brilliant. So for me, it is, I go back to a, a something that I shared on, on social media a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and that is, uh, if it, whatever the it is for us, isn't enough now, it won't be enough when or then either. So getting to that place, you know, even if we're not at a place of, you know, connection with a partner or financial success or, you know, career success, being okay with the isness of the doing that we are in right now is going to serve us much more. It's going to serve us in much more efficiently delivering us to those outcomes we are desirous for, as opposed to focusing on the things we don't have. If we're focused on the things we don't have, there is lack of abundance, there is scarcity, and then chances are we are going to experience more scarcity because that's where the system's focus is at. So the hunger ghost is just that. It is a ghost. It's attachment to things outside of ourselves for perceived fulfillment, satisfaction, acceptance, um, love, and or worthiness even. And so really taking stock of is what I'm thinking, feeling, or experiencing coming from the outside in? Is this something I've learned? Is this something that was given to me or forced upon me? Or is this something that is from my intuition? Is this from my gut? Is this from my inner knowing? Um, my, my wife calls them truth bumps, where you get goose, you know, you, you get chicken skin or goose skin when you have this internal knowing and, and a allowing or admittance to yourself that this is the true core answer below all of the, all of the noise, all of the static. Those are the practices of, of really you know, getting, getting to the now, getting to the isness and reducing the attachment. Again, it's attachment or resistance. We're either resistant to what we don't have, or we're resistant to what we do have or attached to what we don't and releasing both. And again, it's a practice. It's not going to happen overnight, although it can, because it's, it's energy. So it can be a quantum flip. 
Um, but so much is enmeshed and embedded at the subconscious level. And it's, it's been writing our programs of life since, since inception. And so it's, it, it, sometimes it can take more, you know, more effort to, to decouple ourselves from these entanglements and to get to those observational places of, oh, I need this product or I need the newest release or I need to post on social and then pulling back and really examining that need. So true. I love what you said about the hungry ghost is really realizing that it's just a ghost anyway. Yeah. It's illusion. I love it, your teachings. I love everything you do. It's in the way you explain it too. It's so clear. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you, Kevin, for being Thank you. you. Oh, and right back at you, Valeria. Thank you for everything you're doing. So we're almost at the end now. Let me ask you a few questions. But before that, would you like to add anything else or read a passage in your book? I, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm really just enjoying having the conversation. Um, for those that are interested, the book's available uh, anywhere, you know, books are sold. Uh, right, right now, it's primarily online. Um, more information, you can find out at uh, radicalenlightenment.com. There's a lot more resources and perspective and information uh, outside of the book as well that uh, helps to support and extend and expand the journey even more. Um, so that's a great starting place if anybody's interested in, in diving deeper into anything we're talking about. Yes, and I'll have the link on your podcast profile too. Oh, thank you. My last question is, what are three things you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body? Unconditional love would be first. And that's really reconnecting with our natural state. We, we come from unconditional love and we're born into a world of a lot of conditions. And so that would be number one, unconditional love. Pure joy would be another because I think those ecstatic moments are, uh, aren't as, as, as prevalent as, as, as they can be. And the third would be actually contrast that challenges our perceptives, our perception, our perspectives, and our beliefs. Because without contrast, so I, I really do think boiling it all down, we're here to experience the contrast of the world and release resistance to all of the contrast we experience. And because we do live in this kind of duality incubator, this, this uh, duality, yes, no, on, off, good, bad uh, incubator of existence in our universe, that's what we're here to do. We're here to experience the contrast. We're not here to be fixed. We're not here to be um, finite. We're not here to be uh, boxed in. So the more that we are willing and able to let, to allow and, able, and let ourselves experience, uh, things that we might not agree with conceptually, things we might not, uh, that might, you know, be, we not, might not think we can do or things we might be fearful of, like going on a roller coaster or signing up to run a 5k or taking the shot and asking, you know, your best friend out or, going for that job that you've always wanted or shifting careers into something that really lights you up from something that you can use your natural talents with and match your interests with that, that to me is living a fulfilled life. And all of that begins with experiencing contrast and releasing resistance to contrast. Thank you so much again, Kevin, for sharing your presence, and the wisdom that flows through you naturally and everything else in between that could be felt today. Thank you. Valeria, thank you so much for, for the conversation, for the opportunity, the insight, uh, and, and our intersection on these journeys. Really beautiful to have met you today. Take good care, Kevin. We'll talk soon. You as well. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Kevin Russell and his work, please visit RadicalEnlightenment.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.